He's somebody who was incredibly important in Kate and my lives and our inspiration for starting One Young World in the first place was Kofi Annan. Um, an amazing statesman uh, and we've been hugely influenced by his life and work and uh, tragically he is no longer with us but to honor him we're going to host an annual memorial lecture and to give the Kofi Annan Memorial Lecture please welcome back uh, an amazing woman who probably is single-handedly responsible for us trending on Twitter with her 1.3 million uh, followers. Please welcome back Councillor Tuli Madonsela and with her Mr. Anand's eldest son, Kojo Anand. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here today at the 2019 One Young World Summit for this lecture in honor of my late father. What a formidable, formidable representation of young leaders you are from over 190 countries. I thoroughly enjoyed your opening ceremony this week at the Royal Albert Hall. My father's work with One Young World began at the inaugural One Young World Summit in London in 2010, following the campaign that he led with Kate and David for climate action. A proud African, my late father, also joined the One Young World Summit in 2013 in Johannesburg. Nothing lifted his spirits more than seeing so many young people committed to taking on the world's greatest challenges. And so he remained with you from Bangkok to Bogota. He was eager to share his wisdom and to spread the message that change is possible. My father, Kofi Atta Annan, was indeed born during a time of great change. He grew up in the Ghana of Kwame Nkrumah during an era of Pan-Africanism. As a teenager, he witnessed his country gain independence in 1957 after many, many years of colonial rule, and this fostered in him the mindset of impossible is nothing, the key ingredient of him later being known as the stubborn optimist. The first Secretary General to rise from within the ranks, he took an unshakable sense of purpose, poise and optimism with him into this office. The current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said of my father, Kofi Annan was the UN and the UN was Kofi Annan. The sheer number of initiatives he trailblazed is mind-blowing. In the early 2000s, he called on the inter international community to launch the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. In the years since, programs supported by the Global Fund have saved more than 22 million lives. In 2001, he was awarded the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize for his extraordinary contributions towards a more peaceful world together with the entire United Nations. He was instrumental in the adoption of the principle of the responsibility to protect, a global political commitment which was endorsed by all member states of the United Nations at the 2005 World Summit in order to address its four key concerns to pre prevent genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. On the 23rd of August last year, shortly after my father's passing, George Nell, founding director of the UN Global Compact, published an article dubbing him the father of the modern corporate sustainability movement. The UN Global Compact is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative with 13,000 corporate participants and other stakeholders over 170 countries all initially supporting the work of the Millennium Development Goals, which he founded, and this helped and laid the foundation for the 17 Universal Sustainable Development Goals and the 169 targets that we all have today. More than ever before in human history, we share a common destiny. 
We can master it only if we face it together. He spent his lifetime reminding the world of that. Our ability to successfully implement these shared blueprints for peace and prosperity for people and planet depends almost entirely on our willingness to work together collectively across borders and divisions. It's little surprise that the importance of focus, of responsibility, of unity, and of teamwork for achieving progress were instilled in me throughout my childhood and well into my adulthood. But perhaps most important were the lessons he taught me about respect. From messenger to president, every person is the reigning monarch of their own special kingdom. Every person deserves to be acknowledged. Wherever he dined, he would speak in the language of the waiter and make the effort to establish a common bond. Whether Korean, Japanese, Italian, Ethiopian, Turkish or French, he would connect. The ability to build cultural bridges across divides is growing increasingly important, especially in a world where populism, nationalism and extremism have taken hold. If we can't respect each other, how on earth can we respect our planet? We have the rocket science. My father knew firsthand the most crisis, whether climate change, poverty, war, or violent extremism, threaten us, not because we don't know how to resolve them, but because we lack the political will to do so. He set up the Kofi Annan Foundation to mobilize those who are in a position to influence and bring leadership to the world's most pressing problems. Sometimes they are high-level leaders, heads of state, corporate leaders, and opinion shapers. But sometimes they are people like you and I. If my father were here today, he would reiterate that each of you is a potential leader. To lead means to take responsibility and to set the example. In 2016, he convened Extremely Together, 10 young leaders to stand against violent extremism. Together, they produced the world's first guide, the world's first guide, excuse me, by young people, for young people, on how to counter violent extremism in the community. He did this because he truly believed that you're never too young to lead and never too old to learn. Always lead, always learn. That was my father's legacy. What would be yours? The clock is ticking. Time waits for no one. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Tuli Mandoncella, who will be delivering the One Young World's Kofi Annan Lecture. Professor Mandoncella is the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice and Law at the University of Stellenbosch, where she conducts and coordinates social justice research and teaches constitutional and administrative law. She's also the founder of the Tuma Foundation, an independent democracy leadership and literacy social enterprise. An advocate of the High Court of South Africa, Professor Manoncella has been a lifelong activist on social justice, constitutionalism, human rights, good governance, and the rule of law. Named one of Time 100's most influential people in, in the world in 2014, and Forbes Africa Person of the Year 2016. Professor Mandoncella is one of the drafters of South Africa's constitution and co-architect of several laws that have sought to anchor South Africa's democracy. She recently completed a seven-year term as South Africa's public protector, a quasi-judicial administrative oversight body responsible for investigating and redressing maladministration, corruption, executive ethic violations, and related improprieties in state affairs. She's a co-architect and founding chairperson of the African Ombudsman Research Center, and she's also a co-founder and one of the inaugural leaders of the South African Women Lawyers Association. She has a global reputation for integrity and fearlessness. Her work has received national and global recognition, including several Lifetime Achievement Awards. She has five honorary Doctor of Law degrees, 
with two approved honorary doctorates awaiting a date of conferment. She's a Torberg global leader, and among others, she spent a year at Harvard in 2017 as an advanced leadership fellow. Professor Manoncella is a Paul Harris Fellow, recipient of Transparency International's Integrity Award, the German Africa Prize, and Africa Anti-Corruption Crusader Award, amongst her innumerable accolades. She's clearly someone who never stops learning. <laughs> Professor Manoncella, the stage is yours. Thank you, Concha. Good evening, One Young World. What a privilege it is to have the honor of speaking to you tonight and to honor an epic leader and remarkable human being, Kofi Annan. Thank you, Kate Robertson. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ella Robertson, and thank you to the entire One Young World family for this privilege. And above everything else, thank you to Kofi Annan for the legacy he has left us with. And thank you to his family, including Kojo, for agreeing that I'm worthy to present this lecture. When we had the opening ceremony on Monday, I was struck by the unity among us, about the unity among young people, particularly two moments struck me. One was the moment when the two Korean countries joined their flags. I'm a Christian. I'm not sure if Kofi Annan can see us, but if he did see us on that day, there must have been a smile on his face. The other moment on the same day was when our fellow counselor, who has now become the Duchess of Sussex was received with much enthusiasm by her colleagues, the young people of One Young World. <clears throat> Kofi Annan, above everything else, was concerned about a peaceful world His UN work, his One Young World embracement, his work on Extremely Together was about leveraging the spirit of young people to create a more inclusive world in the interest of peace and the rule of law. When we celebrated on arrival here, this reminded me of a song we used to sing as young Seventh Day Advocate, um, young Seventh Day Adventists. We called ourselves Pathfinders. The song said, There is no color to the soul. And indeed, there is no color to the soul. Olive Schreiner, an English woman who eventually became a South African woman, said, when we go underground, we all go six feet under. It doesn't matter whether we are a man or a woman, 
or black or white. And if it were more than days, he would have, she would have said, it doesn't matter what your nationality is, your height, your sexual orientation, all of us go six feet under. And she thought it was idiotic, therefore, for Cecil Joan Rhodes, who was also from this country, but who believed in the hierarchy of human beings. Kofi Annan's, Kofi Annan's dream of a new world anchored in leaving no one behind in the interest of peace and shared prosperity led him to pioneer sustainable development goals, as we have heard from his son. That was visionary because he chose hope over fear. Many people believe that when there isn't enough, the best thing is to hoard. And yet others think that when there isn't enough, maybe we should join hands to create more. And that was his view of a better world. In South Africa, or in Southern Africa, starting from Rwanda, we call this Ubuntu. Humanity. I am because you are. My humanity is defined by yours. If I help you to thrive, I'm helping myself because together we're better against the elements. Incidentally, social animals still believe in that. How many of you recently saw a video of elephants where one head of elephants had a mother trying to take out her kid from a ditch? unsuccessfully, then a matriarch from a different head comes and, pull out, and pulls out the little one. And as she does so, her own head stands between the little elephant and the pride of lions that are looking at the little one as a potential for lunch. That's always been the basis of humanity. Strength in groups. Making sure everyone is healthy, not sick. Everyone eats enough so that everyone can work. And that's what has inspired Sustainable Development Goals, taking over from Millennium Development Goals. It also inspired Kofi Annan and his colleagues to drive the UN Global Compact to bring business to the party. In the book, How to Make a Difference, by Kate and Ella Robertson, Anan is quoted as having said, I quote, peace and justice are sides of the same coin." I agree with him. Social injustice is at, at the core of fracture in the world. Global leaders knew that. That's why social justice was at the core of the UN Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the UN Charter on Human Rights that preceded that. In fact, globally, when there was still a threat of communism, everyone was concerned about social justice because there was worry that communism was going to take over. But it seems to me that being concerned about social justice simply to avert what you believe is a great agenda, is a greater danger is not being just fully. It is justice as just us, as opposed to justice 
is justice for all. But here we are at One Young World. Kofi Annan had faith in young people. And research shows that millennials, in any century, millennials are concerned about everyone's welfare. They're concerned about peace. And you have proven to be equally concerned. But Kofi Annan said to fully harness the power of young people to change the world for the better for everyone, something needs to be done. And he said the following is quoted in How to Make a Difference. Young people must be empowered as agents, not simply as targets for peace and reconciliation. Our dinner starter on Monday included a quote from Kofi Annan that says, you're never too young to lead and never too old to learn, which means the rest of us can be young again by learning. So if that's the vision that Kofi Annan had, a vision of social justice, and the UN defines social justice as just and fair distribution of opportunities, resources or assets, and privileges in society. At the University of Stellenbosch, um, at the Social Justice Chair and M Plan, we also add distribution of burdens, because even if opportunities, assets, and privileges are evenly distributed. If burdens are not evenly distributed, you will be left behind. But why do we have a hungry world then? We have a world that is hungry for peace, a world that's hungry for work, a world that is literally hungry. There's so much wealth in this world. For example, 1% of adults own 40% of global assets. 1% of the richest own 40% of global assets. And the richest 10% accounted for 85% of global assets, whilst the bottom half accounted for only 1%. And that was many years ago in the year 2000. Flip to 20. 18. Oxfam says in 2018, 82% of the wealth of the world belonged to 1% of the global population. While 3.7 billion people who make the poorest half of the world found themselves starving. In fact, one statistic from Oxfam is interesting. We're living on hard times, hence we're seeing a lot of protests all over the world. Well, some of it might be engineered by political entrepreneurs, but a lot of it has to do with poverty, hunger, and related problems. But dollar millionaires keep increasing every day. In the last 10 years, the number of dollar millionaires doubled. While the number of those who live on less than $5.5 per day is at 50%. In South Africa, 
the number of poor people is 55.5%. In some provinces, 72%, or at least in one province. There is a book that's written called Factfulness. And it says we shouldn't despair because things aren't as bad as they look. Well, that's called comfort to somebody who goes for three days without a meal. For children who are getting stunted brain development because of malnutrition. So before we even worry about food security, there's also the fact that even the food that some people eat is not nourishing them. Whereas many of our constitutions, certainly ours talk about freeing the potential of every person and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promises everyone all the human rights. Whilst the Vienna Declaration of 1993 says human rights are interdependent and therefore you can't enjoy one when others are suppressed. A lot has been said at this conference about our problems with climate change that we've taken from the environment without giving back, which is not what communities that were based on Ubuntu were doing because they understood that the environment is a source of sustenance and that when you take, you have to give back. Thank goodness, again, you young people in this room and elsewhere in the world are taking charge of the fight to save the environment. And many grown-ups, as you have seen, who are working with us are doing the same. But sometimes we're struggling between saving the environment and feeding the hungry. Because often when we make policy choices, we don't think about what do we replace what we're taking with. If, for example, we say an end to jobs in a particular region, do we make sure that the green jobs go to the same region? Or do we just say the poor will find out how to move forward? Well, one of my students in the final year constitutional law class said something remarkable. I was asking them, what is at stake if we don't deal with social justice? What is at stake for us, humanity? We know the, we know the poem about the cold within, which I'm not gonna repeat, but this one student said, there's an African saying that hungry ears cannot hear. And Koviana knew that because although he was about educating young people about tolerance, peace, and the rule of law, and about democracy as a better way of being, he also understood that that has to be matched with initiatives to improve human lives and ensure no one is left behind. Hence the SDGs and later the MDGs. Hence the MDGs and later the SDGs. In Zulu we say, indlala ibanga ulaga, which means hunger causes anger. Sociologists call it hunger. There's many people in this world who are Angry. We call upon the police to enforce the rule of law. But it's not going to be possible when there's too many people who are breaking the law because that's the only way to be heard. Protest is the diplomacy of the unheard, whilst violence is the language of the disempowered. So we don't have to advance social justice purely because we're afraid of the fight back by those who are left behind. In fact, economists are, are increasingly realizing that when we leave some of us behind, 
we do so at our own peril. World Bank has done studies that show that when we leave women behind by underpaying them or excluding them from jobs, we are stunting our own development as a community. And that doesn't need rocket science, because if you have a car that has two engines, why function on one? You are going to underperform. There's something interesting that is said by a group of researchers headed by Deninger. We say that education is one of the greatest weapons to change the world and to change the lives of people, particularly the poor. And Mandela believed in that and Anand believed in that. But according to Deninger and colleagues, a highly unequal distribution of assets reduces the effectiveness of educational interventions. This is part of our research also at the social justice chain. We are finding that poverty operates like an epidemic. You know, an epidemic feeds on other things. If, for example, we look at HIV, it's going to feed on other diseases that bring you down. Poverty feeds on other determinants, on education, on access to health, on geographic disparities, uh, or residential spatial disparities, and everything. So if you only deal with one, you're not going to lift people out of the poor. That's why um, at a conference I attended in Chile, when the Nobel organization was looking at the future of education, one of the professors warned us against telling poor countries to invest in education only. That if you invest in education only, you're solving one problem, but you're, solving the, you're not solving the whole problem because poverty is still going to be there. Look at Zimbabwe, for example. Majority of Zimbabweans are educated, but are so poor. So you need a systems approach to things. And the greatest challenge we have, dear colleagues, is asset distribution. Where do we go on social justice? I'm one of those people who believes that we need to go beyond the notion of countries as economies. Because our constitutions do not define our countries as economies. I don't know if anybody comes from a country whose constitution defines you as an economy. Your constitution defines a country as a community, and therefore the economy should serve the community. We should define ourselves as a community. And I've seen with the Nordic countries that that's the way they do things. And that means when we look at the economy, then we should transcend GDP. And I believe we can do this. How can we do this? Firstly, we need leaders like Anan, leaders like Mandela, Eleanor Roosevelt, and many others who understood that as long as there's injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anyway. We need young people who understand that you're, not too, you're never too young to lead, and that's you. But we also need to work together. So here's what I suggest as a way forward. Firstly, light is powerful against darkness. But when you combine lights, light becomes formidable against darkness. To begin, we need to find other people to connect with, to connect our lives, so that this movement is multiplied. Number two, 
we need to lobby governments to rethink their policies to move beyond one size fits all. Because when our policies are one size fits all, those who don't fit in fall through the cracks. That includes those who have been disadvantaged by historical policies that disadvantage them, whether on the basis of gender, ethnicity, culture, etc. We have an opportunity with SDGs to make a difference. But SDGs need funding. What we're doing in the Social Justice Unit in South Africa as part of the Musa Plan for Social Justice is asking civil society to contribute towards a fund to advance social justice, an action for inclusion fund. Imagine if all of our countries were to establish something like what they have at Whole Foods, where when you come in and you're buying something, you ask if you want to put in a pound or a dollar or whatever your currency is in addition to go to this fund. And this fund is not sectorially invested. It is invested in, in those communities where poverty is hitting people the hardest. I genuinely believe that we could reach those SDGs. Of course, we also need to make sure that corruption does not steal existing resources. So dear young people, dear One Young World, every generation has a responsibility to define the most pressing challenge of its time. So previous generations defined, for example, slavery as wrong, and they did something about it. Colonialism is, long, is wrong, did something about it. Gender inequality, LGBTI, at least most generations made sure that the law deals with that. But we still have de facto inequality. And it's a threat to our existence together with climate change. We already are doing something about it. So going forward, why not scale what we are doing? Why not broaden the circle or make the circle bigger, as you say, as young people? And if we do so, 2030, here we come and would have made poverty history and reduced structural inequality considerably. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>